for far too long, shame has overshadowed the topic of sex, causing many to feel utterly lost when it comes to developing a biblical, healthy perspective on sexuality. You'll find that our Healthy Sexuality series consists of speakers and panelists and is formatted as family-style conversations where sincere responses are shared. In settings like these, we encourage all of our speakers and panelists to bring authenticity and honesty, and with that may come viewpoints or perspectives that Hope Church doesn't entirely share, and that's okay. We believe this content is fresh wisdom that is going to point you back to the Father's heart, bring clarity, and offer practical tools to walk in God's original design for sexuality. All right. Well, welcome everybody tonight. We're so glad you're here. Um, how many were here Sunday? Okay, you came back. It's wonderful. Um, our desire for these uh, Wednesday nights, these next three Wednesday nights tonight, next Wednesday, and uh, the, the Wednesday after, is to really just begin this conversation uh, about God's design for sexuality. How many want God's design for it? Yeah, that's why you're here. And our heart is that we would um, really equip the church um, to walk in what God's design is. Like Ephesians 4 said, I talked about this a little bit Sunday, that we would be equipped, we'd be empowered, um, so that we're not just tossed back and forth by every ideology that's happening around us, but that we're rooted um, and we're grounded and we're bound to truth and radical compassion. Together, Jesus is grace and truth, and we want to be a people that are formed in the likeness of Jesus in every way. And so tonight is about that, so that we would grow healthy, um, mature, and full of love, and we could show the world what really living is. God's designed for that. How many say amen to that? Yeah. So tonight, um, we're going to do something a little different um, in that we're having uh, Jeremy Williamson speak for a little bit. I'll tell you about him in a minute. And then we're going to do a little question and answer time, some questions that have been sent in. And we want to do that. We also want to have a time of response with ministry as well tonight. So it's going to be so good. Um, Jeremy uh, and his wife, Rachel, and their three kids have been a part of Hope over the last couple of years. And I have just grown to love this guy. He's amazing. Jeremy has had uh, over 20 years of pastoral ministry um, as a, a pastor, a church planner, a missionary, 14 years of pastoral counseling. Um, and I'll tell you, you're going to sense this right away. He's got such uh, just a touch of God on his life that's full of, of grace and wisdom. And uh, it's, it's beautiful. We've had lots of coffees together over the last year. And I wanted to invite him to come and share tonight on sexual identity and restoration. And then um, we're going to get into some questions and answers. So would you guys put your hands together and welcome Jeremy as he comes tonight? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Josh. Man, so good. So good to be here with you guys tonight. I'm so honored. Yeah. And um, like my mother-in-law's in the room and I'm about to talk about sex. So can we just <laughs> name that? <laughs> hey. <laughs> Jeez. Anyways, I'm so happy to be here. And um, what, an, what an honor to be standing on this stage and to get to share with you guys tonight. I I do have the, just the incredible privilege of walking holy ground, walking in the, the sacred spaces of the soul with um, lots of pastors and missionaries, um, lots of people in ministry who are hurting and who need care themselves, and that's just such a great honor. Um, my wife and my kids and I have just so enjoyed being a part of this family, being a part of this house. I was mentioning to my 12-year-old son, uh, I was like, hey, dude, I'm speaking at church on Wednesday. And he goes, oh, cool, Dad, what are you talking about? And I go, bow, 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 which is like, you know, the old Marvin Gaye song, right? 12 years old, doesn't miss a beat. I've been really trying, baby. And I was like, <laughs> okay, my 12 year old knows, let's get it on. And then I was like, my 12 year old knows, let's get it on. <laughs> We needed another talk, I think, after that. But I think Josh, if you were here Sunday, Josh did such an incredible job of leading us into, yeah. 
such a good job of leading us into what are deep and mysterious waters. Um, the realm of our identity and of sexuality, of gender, that is, that is a place as we begin to walk into that, there is uh, so much nuance and there's so much mystery, and yet the Bible is so super clear. And um, I just feel like our pastor did an incredible job of starting to lead us into that. But isn't that true that when we start, when we start to wander into the realm of, of our identity and our bodies and of sexuality, that that is a place that God designed to be full of glory and passion and delight and, yes, mystery. I love how it's written in Proverbs chapter 30. Um, I want to read it from the King James Version because it's especially poetic. Uh, he said, there be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, wonderful for me, yea, four, which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Isn't it true that all of creation is so amazing? All of creation is so beautiful, and it's impossible to comprehend. As a part of my job, I get to spend time every year in the backcountry of Colorado and in the Sierras in California. And, man, it is just unbelievable the things that God has made. The art and the work and the beauty of God is amazing. And you and your body and your sexuality are a part of the beauty and the artwork and the majesty of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says it so well. Paul wrote, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That word that uh, Paul uses there, his workmanship, it's this Greek word, it's poema. Does that sound familiar? We are the workmanship, the craftsmanship. We get poetry from that word. We are the poetry of God. We are the masterpiece of God. We are the artwork. We are the thing that when God created it, when God created Adam and when he created Eve, he stood back and he said, there's, there's the masterpiece. It's taken me six long days as the God of the universe to create this masterpiece. And there it is. And we are also well aware that there is a thief. There is evil that exists in the world. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to only to steal and to kill and to destroy. And, but I came that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. So when we talk about, yes, the beauty of sexuality, we're going to talk a little bit more of that, about that tonight. We cannot have that conversation without also acknowledging the fact that we have an enemy that has been working to destroy the masterpiece of God for many, 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 many years. And so here we are, like, doing life in the mix of the glory and the abundance and the delight of God and also the ferocious and the relentless attack of evil. So what does the enemy want? He wants to steal and kill and destroy. Why does he want to do that? Because he hates God, and he hates the love of God, and he hates the image of God, and he can't stand it. And guess who is the embodiment of the image and the love and the beauty of God? So it's no wonder that I'm his target and that you're his target, because we are the workmanship of God. You don't see the enemy out there going after the trees and he's like, you know, killing the trees and making fish die. He's not. He's after the workmanship and the craftsmanship of God, which is you and I. But here's the interesting thing. He hates the image and the glory of God. He doesn't actually have the ability to destroy the glory of God, does he? Evil, evil doesn't have the capacity to destroy the image or the love or the glory of God. He never will. And so what does he do? Well, he tries to distort it. He works to diminish it. And, and you know what one of his favorite things is? One of his favorite things is to convince you that it's shameful so that you hide it. That works real well. 
See, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 5, he said, you're the light of the world. Yeah, you, when I made you, we were there in the garden, and I was there with Jesus, and Holy Spirit was there, and we were like, we made you, and we were like, whoo, this is good. And this is the light of the world. And you know what? We didn't make the light of the world, this city on a hill. Like, the way that we designed you, you can't be hidden. People, people don't light a lamp. Jesus and I, when we were making everything, we didn't light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, we put you on a stand so that you, as the workmanship of God, could give light to all in the house, Jesus said. I know you might be thinking, like, wait, 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 wait. I, I don't think Jesus is necessarily talking about, like, sex here or gender. I never thought of this verse that way. Like, when I was a kid and I heard this verse, I always imagined, like, I am the light of the world when I'm on the corner with a, like, a, I don't know, I always just imagined, like, a megaphone preaching or something. Like, I'm the light of the world when I'm being an evangelist or when I'm praying for people or when I'm witnessing or something. To imagine, I am the light of the world. A candle is passive. It didn't create itself. It didn't set itself on fire. It's just there as light. And so if the enemy wants to come and convince us to hide that our light, that our glory is somehow shameful. I mean, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, then the eyes of both of them after they ate the fruit, the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. What did they do? And they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves loincloths covering up the light of the world. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid them. So I, I have tears coming to my eyes as I say it. How effective is evil? How effective is shame? The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Because evil is very effective at convincing us that our glory, that the image, the craftsmanship, the wonderful, the beauty of God is something to be hidden and something to be ashamed of. So yes, Ephesians chapter 2, we are God's masterpiece. That glory includes my gender and my sexuality. It does. Your masculinity, your femininity, wherever you feel like you, if you feel like you're super masculine, dude, great. If you feel like you're maybe not so masculine, whatever. And, and same with you ladies, wherever you are in that, it is a city on a hill. It is, the, it is the reflection of the image of God. Ladies, women, your tenderness and your wisdom and your mama bear fierceness, and your loveliness, and your nurturing, and your breasts, and your womb. That is you partnering with the God of the universe to bring beauty and to bring life into the world. All of that, wherever you feel, however you feel about it, it is absolutely a part of the image of God. It is absolutely the reflection of the beauty and the fierceness and the tenderness and, and the ability to bring forth life that God has. And men... Similarly, our strength and our power and our kindness and our voice that I believe we uniquely have this ability to speak a fatherly and a priestly blessing, our voice, and yes, our genitals, the penis, and the testicles, yes, that is also a part. We are partnering with God to bring our strength and to bring beauty and to bring love and to bring life into the world. It is all a part of the beauty and the wonder in the image of God. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis chapter 127. Now, when he says male and female, the word he uses there for male, he doesn't use anywhere else in the Bible. And I, I think it's interesting because this text is a little bit offset, almost like it's a poem or a song. And the word for male that he uses there is zakar. And the, the Hebrew word for female that's used there is nekeba. 
Zakar is a very simple term. In fact, there are words in Arabic that are still used that are similar. It means the one who pierces. So like he's talking about his penis. You only said it once. I've gotten it in twice already. <laughs> it was my goal to beat that. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, but can we just, there's a whole thing about this. If you, if you imagine the one who pierces, the one who brings his strength, the part of the image of God that shows up and brings life. And similarly, the word that he uses for women, unekeba, means the one who has the hollowness, the one who has the ability to carry life and to nurture. And so God says, as he is his final proclamation, the image of God, this is all he says, the image of God, the one who pierces and the one who has the hollowness within her that can bear life, that is the image of God. Male and female created he them. So let me tell you, there has never been a moment in your life There has never been a moment where God has been ashamed of your breasts or of your penis or of your vagina. He's never been ashamed of those parts of you. He's never been ashamed of your sexuality. Not even a moment. And so then we understand that as the image of God, our bodies and our gender, they reflect his goodness. And not only that. Like, we were made with a purpose. Right after that verse where God says, yeah, male and female, the one who pierces and the one with the holiness, they're the image of God. And then he looks at Adam and Eve and he goes, bow, 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 bow. Like he says, he said, listen, so now go, be fruitful and multiply. He's like, go, go. You'll figure it out. He's like, and bonus, I added like a gazillion extra nerve endings. It's going to be good. I even gave you an extra organ or two in there. You're going to like it. (laughs) And I just, I can just imagine God looking over at Jesus and like, we'll see them in about a week. (laughs) And, and all of that, all of that, giving life and partnering with God, not just in like some, and of course, as we're going to get into, like sex is obviously not just about some mating thing where we're just reproducing it's like if you're a human there is such a powerful connection that Jesus even when he's quoting uh, Genesis says for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife and the two will become one there's so much beauty and unity in the masculinity of the image of God and the femininity of the image of God coming together and for some reason when that image is complete life is created like wow So much goodness in that. And so we know that the enemy obviously knows this too. And evil is very precise. The enemy doesn't come at us with a shotgun. He is after the glory of God in you. So his goal is to distort and destroy your sense of masculinity, your femininity, and your sexuality. And so tonight, the rest of the time that I have, I just want to give you some context for how this works. And with sort of the caveat of like the time that we have tonight does not do this topic justice. And so please forgive me that what I'm I'm going to share, I hope begins to open up some pathways. Uh, Lauren said it so well earlier of hope for you and of of the idea that maybe there's another story happening in your brokenness, um, that maybe the story is more complex than we've been led to believe by the enemy. So, I think I've already said that as we come into the world, all of us are born carrying the goodness and the image and the glory of God. So very precisely, the enemy begins to come after us. So I'm born like just a boy, and I have these built-in expectations uh, for attachment and for care and for caregivers that are loving and for affection and for touch. And I have all of these things built into me, all of these needs. And inevitably, at some point in my life, usually it's pretty early on, I realize that the world is broken. At some point, I, um, I'm faced with the reality that I may not be cared for the way that I thought I was going to be or the way that I had hoped for. 
And I don't know when it happened for you. I don't even know when it first happened for me. But at some point, all of us experience the brokenness of the world. And that could, of course, come through something super tragic like abuse or maybe a parent who is distant or unavailable. Maybe you had the opposite. Maybe you had a, a parent who consumed you and you were like their surrogate spouse. Maybe, um, you know, we, when we talk about abandonment, it's, it's not whether you've been abandoned or whether you've experienced abandonment. It's how did you experience abandonment? Maybe it was exposure to pornography or sexuality. Maybe it was the anger of a parent. Whatever it is, however it happened when you were a child, here's the thing and where the enemy is cunning is that as you're growing up, those tender early years when he starts to come against you, that is when your ability to attach securely to another human being emotionally, your attachment styles, what that's called, that is starting to come online. And it is 100% how your parents have been with you and what your caretakers are like and what home feels like, your future ability to be with someone emotionally and to be vulnerable and to, to be able to allow someone else into your world, it's being developed there. So is your arousal template. Arousal template, that's a weird word. So your arousal template is the same thing. It is what eventually, it's what's forming as you're a child and eventually it's what turns you on. It's what you're attracted to. It's what you're, how, what arouses you, specifically you. And the enemy is aware that right then he has the ability through tragedy and through uh, all of these difficult situations to, de to develop a cycle of brokenness within you that can affect you for the rest of your life. And it starts right then. So he has the ability to plant seeds of shame that are intended, again, to convince you to hide your glory eventually to experience brokenness in this way. So I quickly want to show you sort of what this looks like. Can move this up here a little bit? Okay. So let's say at the very beginning of all of this, this whole cycle, we start with um, an event. Now, this could be a million little things. It could be like, Death by a thousand paper cuts. It could be, you know, a, a bunch of little, maybe dad didn't show up for my football games and he wasn't, whatever. Or event could also just be something that's big and that's, that's tragic. So we have events. Then from there, I'm going to keep moving on and I realize from this stage you may not be able to see everything. But when an event happens, following is an interpretation. That and we're going to go back through this, but that interpretation inevitably, when the enemy is at work, leads to shame. And shame leads to a vow. So the enemy is well aware of how this works. Let me explain how this works. So let's say, let's say that my dad um, was never around. And he was never, he never seemed to be interested in my life. Okay? That's the event. Now, the sad thing is, kids are excellent observers, but they're terrible interpreters. And so, I'm a kid, and, and dad never comes to my games, and he doesn't care. He's just busy with his job. And I interpret that as, with the enemy's help, of course. He doesn't love me. He's not interested. That's not interested in me. So, so then I move into shame because inevitably it's my fault. Dad doesn't show up and it's because he doesn't love me and it's because there's something wrong with me. Because if I was a little more sporty or maybe a little better grades, or maybe a little more interested in what dad does, like, but I'm not, so there's something wrong with me. So now, you know what? That's fine. I'm just gonna like hide, or I'll just fine. I'll just pretend like I'm like dad, even though I'm not. I'm gonna make a vow to defy and to hide the actual image of God, the actual way that I'm created, and I'm either gonna hide it and just go into a shell and stop trying, or I'm gonna become someone I'm not so that I can please dad. Does that make sense? 
Another way to think about this um, is let's say that the event is sexual abuse. And when sexual abuse happens, the level of betrayal is is impossible for a child to comprehend. And the violence mixed into the event is the physiological impossible to stop arousal that perhaps the one who was abused experienced. I can't tell you how many men that I've met who their interpretation of the abuse was in part based on the fact that they had an erection while they were being abused and their own body betrayed them. And so now, that's easy. I'm dirty. I got a secret. I'm broken. I'm damaged goods. I'm perverted. And so that means that this is just, I guess, the way that I am. I guess it was something about me, my shame says. Something about the way that I carry myself, and maybe I'm only lovable when that happens. And so you know what? Forget it. Forget men or forget women or just forget it. I'm just not going to be part of it. I'm going to go do something else or I'm going to just hide in a cocoon and protect myself or I'm going to act out because if, if that's how I get love, okay, then that's how I'm going to get love and I'm going to continue to let that cycle Go on and on. And so when the enemy establishes this, this is actually, you could make an argument, this is kind of like a neural pathway. When the enemy establishes this kind of a system that is working and he can establish it in our childhood, guess what? This is now a well-worn path that you will go around and around and around and around, and that is the design of the enemy. So now this cycle has been created. Let's say enter something like pornography. And put it in this cycle. I'll tell you, something like pornography, it is, it, and someone goes to porn, just kind of side note, it is not because, like, all guys are horny and they just need that. I said horny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not because of that. Um, there's something else happening there, isn't there? So here I am, I'm standing here in this vow that I've made because of other brokenness, because of the other stories, and I am alone, because what does the enemy want? He wants me to hide, and he wants me to be isolated. And so if I'm engaging in pornography, then suddenly I am just feeding into that same thing. There's an event, which is pornography, and then porn doesn't just, porn has a storyline, and Porn has roles that you play, and people, when I work with men who are struggling with pornography, very often we'll have the conversation of, so what do you type in when you search? Because it's, there's a story, and I guarantee you that we can discover what story, what brokenness is being told by how it's all, like, working together. And it feels like connection, and the temptation feels like it's going to be love. And then there's masturbation, and then there's an orgasm, and there's oxytocin and dopamine, and these things that my brain gives that are supposed to make me feel connected. But then at the end of it, guess what? I'm still alone. And I'm still ashamed. And I'm still the dirty kid who's not going to be loved. And so I'm just going to, now I'm ashamed and I can't tell my pastor and I can't tell my church because it's such a dirty sin. So what does it do? It puts me deeper and deeper and deeper into isolation. You see, pornography is a desperate search for connection that always ends in greater isolation. And so then deeper isolation searches for further, for darker porn or hookups or unwanted sexual behavior. So... Pornography is just one example, right? This, and I wish we had so much time, like this, this kind of a thing. Um, it could be for why it's difficult for you to be intimate with your partner. It could be why it's difficult for you to, to be naked in front of someone, in front of your partner, in front of your, your husband or your wife. 
So the devil creates these cycles of shame and these behavior that do what? They make us hide and isolate the glory of God. So quickly, how do we interrupt this? I want to give you just a couple of words. The first one is confess. Confession. Now, this is what, this is what I knew confession to be when I, was, when I was growing up. Confession was, hey man, yeah, like I did this thing. And I feel super bad about it. And I'm, yeah, it's shameful. And then the guy goes, oh, dude, yeah, let's pray. You pray. It's all right, man. You're going to be good. And so here I was in my vow, living in isolation. I had just, I'm living in this whole thing of shame and isolation. And I, I come out and I'm like, yeah, dude, I did this thing. And he's like, oh, sorry, bro. And then he leaves. And where do I go? Just right back to where I was. See, I wonder, like, why did God, we don't need to confess to people, to other humans to be forgiven. Why did God create that? I was working with a pastor one time, and um, he looked at me, and he said, when I tell you what I'm about to say, and he starts crying, he says, when I say what I'm about to say, I'm pretty sure you're going to leave, and you're never going to want to talk to me again. And he said, I've been looking at homosexual porn, I've been having gay fantasies. And my wife doesn't know. And then he's sitting there and he's waiting for me to do what? He's waiting for me to send him right back there. And I just looked at him. And with tears in my eyes, I said, I'm still here. See, I believe that God invites us to confess whatever's going on here because this un it undoes isolation. Because confession, like confessing sin is actually designed to undo the effect of it. Confession creates brotherhood. Confession creates sisterhood. Creation, confession is an invitation to begin to do life together because I'll tell you, the opposite of sin, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. The opposite of addiction is community. So don't, I don't want to confess to you and then go back to my closet. I want to confess and then be invited by you to come out and to be present and to be seen and for you not to walk away after I tell you what I did. And so how do we do that? The second word I want to give you is curiosity. And this, as a church, this is how we roll. When someone comes to us and they've got something difficult to say and they've been living in this cycle and they get the courage to come out and confess something or to share something, then what, the way that we begin to move toward them is with curiosity. And we say, hey, like, you don't need to hide. Like, it's good. Tell me more about that. So you fell sexually, like you sinned. Like, okay, like, man, what was it like to tell me that? How long has that been going on? Gosh, like, how has it felt to carry that secret? What's it like that I'm here with you right now and I'm not going anywhere? Well, right? Curiosity is to start to just undo. Oh, gosh, it's so beautiful. I wish I had more time. Okay. Yes, I'm going to do it. Because so here's the thing. So here's the thing. I make a promise. I have this vow. And if, if I confess, then... If let's let's just say pornography because we talked about it. Somebody confesses pornography, you're like, oh man, why do you do that? Well, because I'm I'm alone, and I'm always alone, and I'm lonely. Ah, oh, really? Who told you that you were alone? I'm alone because like I don't know. I just feel like when I'm with people, nobody actually wants to hang out with me, and women don't seem to be interested in me. And oh man. Are you sure about that? Like, how, how have you experienced, like, well, to be honest, it started a really long time ago. I've never, even as a kid on the playground, nobody wanted to be with me. So I guess loneliness has been, like, oh, interesting. And the third word is kindness. Oh, interesting, because you know what I want to tell you? Like, when I see you walk in the door at church, Actually, you look like a guy that I wish I knew better. And I'm so sorry for never inviting you out to play. 
I'm sorry that I wasn't the kid knocking on your door in first grade inviting you out. Because what I see is like a masculinity and a playfulness that I, I want to know you. I see the image and the glory of God on you, actually. And you see how like curses can be undone as, with, as a church. We don't just like confess sin and confess sin and just pray and like, okay, like Jesus heal him and and God, please do. I pray that he does. But actually Jesus invites us to participate in the healing of one another through curiosity and through kindness. And so here's here's how I want to close with this. There's so much more work to be done. Um, Every single one of us has been made glorious. I hope you hear that. However you feel about your gender, whatever's happening in whatever your sexual story is, whatever your arousal template's like, whatever this cycle has been in your life, you have been made the actual, the more true thing. Because remember, this is all a lie. The most true thing about you is that you are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus to be a city on a hill. And so that is what's most true. Second, every one of us, we have a story of harm. And we have narratives that repeat themselves in our lives. None of us are exempt from that. And we all need to be the recipients of curiosity and kindness. And every one of us has the ability to offer curiosity and kindness toward one another. Okay. Before we move into the panel tonight, we've got some more. Can I just invite you to pray with me? Would you stand up? And Charity, like, so good the way that uh, during worship she said, like, we're going to make space. We're going to make room. And in her prayer, Charity said, Jesus, we want to invite you into all of these places. And I think that's the prayer that I would like to invite us to pray tonight. Some of you might have gotten a little tripped up when I said that God has never been ashamed of your sexuality. He's never been ashamed of your body. There are sections of you that you have surrendered to God. And maybe there are places in you that you have never allowed Jesus to step foot. And for some of you, I get it. Because it's never been safe for you to allow someone to be in the realm of your sexuality or your body. You learned early on that that's a scary thing to do. So wherever you're at tonight, can we just pray a simple prayer, maybe with our hands open. Say, God, You see my body. You know my whole sexual story. You know my shame. And can we just invite Jesus? Can we consider inviting him into those places of our heart? Jesus, We invite you, Lord, into the places where our bodies have betrayed us. We invite you in to the times when we know what we should do and we don't do it. Instead, we do what we know we shouldn't do. God, we invite you into this cycle and this narrative. And Lord, we invite you to introduce yourself to that little boy or that little girl who was mistreated and who was abused and who began to believe a lie. Jesus, we invite you to bring healing and hope into every part of this difficult cycle, into every part of this story. Jesus, some of us, all we can do is crack the door open a little bit because we're so scared. And Lord, I pray that that would be enough if that's all we can do. If we can just crack the door because the pain is deep and profound and it's so scary. Lord, may we just crack the door open to the possibility that you're good and that you won't participate in our shame or our harm and that you actually do want to meet us there with love. God, we invite you in to all of us, Lord. Thank you that we can trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Josh. Oh, man. So beautiful. All right. You can be seated. Um, are we moving these real quick? If we could. Um, and we're going to... How amazing was that? Was that not just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful? And I'll tell you what, I just even sense right now that the Lord is, is doing a work in this room. Do you sense him working? 
I just even, I just even say, Lord, even right now, Holy Spirit, would you just continue to release healing um, all through the night? Lord, I ask that even right now as we get into these questions that um, you, would, you would equip us, but Lord, also that there would be a continued work that would not stop. Even right now, I pray in Jesus' name. And the chair magically appeared. Thank you. Guys, th- um, that's all right. The stronghold of interpretation just went down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, you guys come sit down. So uh, we're, we're also going to have a little ministry time at the end with our ministry team. Um, and Charity, I was thinking maybe Jesus, You're the Healer might be a good little song to sing later. She loves it when I cue her on the songs. Um, uh, guys, this furniture is actually from my office. So th- this is what I sit in with. Uh, all the people in my office, but um, we have Pastor Aaron and Lauren here. Um, you guys love them. And uh, some of you, we all know Pastor Aaron, but um, Lauren, his beautiful, amazing wife, is a licensed professional counselor um, who specializes in trauma. And so she literally sits in that space day in, day out. Um, and uh, it's, it's such a gift to have her. She's an incredible gift to the body of Christ. And of course, um, Jeremy as well, which he's already shared, and, and Pastor Aaron as well. So you guys sent in a few questions, and we want to be faithful to um, approaching those questions. Um, i just like to say this, that, you know, Sunday morning, um, in this discussion of sexuality um, or any big topic like that, there's always layers of the discussion, Right? So in some ways, on Sunday morning, talking about the theology of the Word of God, in some ways, is actually the easy part. But then the like, how do we walk this out? How then then do we live in this tension in relationship with people? Um, You know, it's really easy, and that's why I hate when things get politicized or that we even join with that spirit of that in the church, because what happens is, is then it becomes an issue rather than becoming about a person. And so, so tonight, as we kind of address this, like, we've kind of talked about God's design for sexuality, Jeremy has tonight, and certainly I approach that Sunday, but then also some of these questions that have come in are really about, like, how do we walk this out in relationship with the people that are around us that, that um, God has given us? So I'm just going to read this real quick here. This first question is such a good question. And so I'm asking the, the panel here, which I like to bring people that are smarter than me, right? Um, and I'll say this too. I was reminded tonight, um, we're not here because we think we have all the answers to everything. Um, we're here because... Um, we just want to begin this discussion and, and kind of help us with these tools to navigate. So the first question is this, as Christians, how are we to engage in a culture that promotes individuals who identify as transgender, furry, homosexual? As a grandparent, this person wrote, how can I in, um, encourage her uh, to, is that... Is that, was that question together? I'm reading this. Yeah. As a grandparent, how can I encourage her to walk in God's plan for her life? Um, she loved action figures when she was young and other boy toys. Maybe we should have discouraged her. So you feel you feel this, right? Um, this this grandparents, um, what, what they're experiencing. Um, I, Jeremy, would you want to just start with that and, and, and speak into that tonight? I just I think I want to say first, um, the like the tenderness and the love of that grandmother just stands out so much. And there's I think there's layers. So I guess I'll start with like her question of what do I do. And I think I hear inside of that was was this our fault? And I just if I was with her, I would just want to like put my hand on her shoulder and say it's. It wasn't your fault, and it's, it's not your problem to solve. It, 
Hi, Josh. I have, there's a, a friend of mine who um, wrestled with something similar in this vein, and his church couldn't handle it. His parents couldn't handle it. But there was one lady, there was one old lady from the church who knew full well what he was dealing with. And um, he, could go, he would go to her house, and she would have sweet tea. They lived in the South. They have sweet tea and fresh-baked cookies. And he, and, and he would just be with her, and that was welcome, and that was love, and that was tenderness. And that was the, the only representation of the love of Jesus in his life. Yeah. Um, because everyone else in his life, including his parents and his church, they were so, like, not sure. Like, if I love you, does that mean I endorse your, your behavior? And yeah. I guess that's worth saying, too, Josh, is, yeah. is love... Um, and loving people, Jesus shows us so clearly, loving people is not the same as endorsing. Yeah. Um, it's okay to love extravagantly um, so good. without fear. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. Lauren, do you want to speak into that as well? Sure. Yeah, um, I love what you just said. It's just the, it's about connection and it's seeing the person first. And I think this child that's going through that, that's a really scary question to go through. And then also we know to even come out to your family. And so the fact that this grandparent knows says that there might be a level of safety they might even feel with their family. Cause I know there's plenty of people that will go throughout life without ever sharing that, especially knowing if their family comes from a Christian background. So holding the space I think of curiosity as a grandparent is really, really going to be valuable. Kind of what he was already talking about of asking the question, extending the, the relationship and even asking, how can I be a support to you? You know, I think there could even warrant if I had the grandparent, um, if they came into my session, let's say for therapy, um, or just in conversation, um, do you think that there is a space if there is influence, there's relationship that, if you were able to have this exchange, I don't know where this person's developmentally, this, this child, but just if you felt inclined that you were scared for them in some way, obviously, like we know, um, there is no fear in love, right? And so if we're communicating out of fear, then they're not going to receive the love of why we have the motive to even have that conversation. So I'm thinking, you know, I think it's important as... Um, spiritual mothers and fathers to lead the way and speak identity. So there's a space, I think, where a grandparent could say, you know this is who you are, and I still see you as this, and I want to honor and understand and support you. And so the, I, I've sat with enough people, kind of like what he was saying, that they were like, you know, we weren't on the same page, but I knew they loved me. And they led me back to the direction. I knew that I could come to that person for the questions I might have with the Lord. Because they're going to only run to the people that are maybe endorsing what's going on. So if they only have the shut doors to the people that would be safe places, that shuts it up. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's so good. I think, too, that there's, um, you know, there isn't an exact um, answer for every situation. You know, when you're sitting before someone or in, in whatever situation it is, we have to follow the Holy Spirit. Yeah. There's, there, we obviously were rooted in the truth of what the Bible says. Um, as believers, we hold to that. But you know what? How I might handle one situation might be a little bit different because I'm following his lead on what I'm supposed to say in that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, somebody asked me the other day, like, how, how, what would you say to... Um, somebody in your class, your child's class, that they um, have switched from being a he to a to a she, and 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 they wanted this like sort of pat answer, and I said I I don't know. I said I would have to be um, really present to the Lord, and a lot of that would de depend on the level of relational equity I had. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I think that we have to be really present. To and sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to the situation. And um, of course, we, we're, we're bound in truth, but we're also walking in this like real time with the Lord with people. Yeah. Can I, that's so yeah, good. Can I add one quick yes. thing? I think as a church, we have, we have been guilty of oversimplifying issues like this to say, to where we lose our curiosity, we lose the ability to step into the mess 
of that, and we just say, oh, well, that's sin, so you repent and you move on. So, like, what do you need to do? Oh, you, you feel this way or that way? Ah, just repent and stop. And that just creates, like, it makes it impossible to do what you're talking about, of actually to lean in with curiosity so that you can understand more of the, there's a story. There's always a story. There's always a story. Yeah. Where there's brokenness, there's always a story. Yeah. And so... Yeah. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've, I've leaned in in conversations with people as there's been confession to me. Um, before I became the lead pastor, it felt like everybody confessed everything to me. Then you become the lead pastor, and then they don't tell you. <laughs> I want to stop that. Like, don't do that. I'm still the same guy. Like, come and confess your sins. And, um, but, uh, well, if I can add to you, if I can add, I, you're funny. Um, I think what is being communicated up here is that there is no solution or answer outside of the context of relationship. And I think we can be, like everything that Jeremy beautifully just said up here, all of it is in the context of relationship. And I think when God designed all of this and he sent his son, he didn't just send a answer, he didn't send peace, he sent the person of peace. He sent the person of love. He sent the person, so it, this relationship, it matters. And I think when we try to s solve things or resolve things in someone's life, outside of relationship, we're going to get in trouble. It's, it's, it's not good. Well, I'll tell you, in those moments uh, where I've met with random people, and specifically in the realm of sexuality, whatever was confessed in that moment, there, were, there have been moments where I felt like I was there to just listen and to hear and I tell you, there's been some moments where the Holy Spirit moved and it was like shikamo. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm telling you, like the Holy Spirit came and it moved in power and that person was delivered in that place. I mean, I have watched this happen and I, and I always believe in that. But here's the thing. It goes back to what he said earlier. Um, we have these encounters with God where God sets us free from something, maybe from a porn addiction, maybe from whatever. And that moment's real, but we still have to learn how to walk that out. Yeah. We still have to learn the new neural pathways and how to walk out freedom. And so I think that's a lot of what we're talking about tonight as well. Okay, so let's take this next one. Um, how do you answer a person when they say they were born as, as gay or homosexual? And um, so I would love to give that to Pastor Aaron. I'm going to defer to Lauren on this one. <laughs> no, seriously. I'll, I'll add in my thoughts later if that's okay. Oh, this is a hard one, and I heard even a uh over here, like, yeah. huh. <laughs> yeah. I think what we're always going to come back to, and if you're met with that, if someone tends to, if someone were to say, I'm gay because I was born this way, Jeremy, and we were talking in the back room before this, and, and he said it beautifully, is it's usually a defense. It's, it, that statement in itself is usually like, Nope, like if I say this, there's no questioning. You can't, it's like the chicken or the egg or nature versus nurture. Because a lot of times I think when people come out as gay or identify as gay or homosexual, transgender, there is this idea that something happened to you. Like we're talking, there's a storyline, right? And I think some people are either not ready or maybe they really don't believe that something has happened to them that has caused this to happen. Yeah. And so I think as far as our response to that is to be curious about, hey, like help me understand that. Like how did you know that you were born gay? When, when, when was the first time that it came up for you? Yeah. And is there anything that you think that could have influenced this? I mean, again, those, those could be good questions to ask. <laughs> But I don't think it's our job to, as Christians, and whether you're walking with non-believers or other Christians, yeah. to be like, no, that's not true. Yeah. Like, it's not to get into this war, I don't think, as much as it is to be curious, sit in that, I don't know. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, well said. <laughs> I think that was really well said. I think, <clears throat> and I think that it is probably good to say that there there is not a definitive body of evidence in the scientific community 
that points to the existence of a switch that is somehow like flipped in the womb for some. Um, they've looked in DNA and brain activity and hormone. Uh, and it's just, it's just not, so it's, you're right on to say like, this is gray in that like there's no, no one can actually say that that is true. Um, they can say that their experience their entire life has been that they've been same-sex attracted. And like, okay, awesome. But I think you're right in that if I'm sitting with someone and, and they say, well, I was born gay. There is, it is, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, and I, and I love you. And I wonder what story is too painful to tell. That, you, that there's got to be like a wall that is just makes that part of your life inaccessible. And I don't need to touch it, actually. I'm not, I'm not here to try to like solve that in your life. I'm so happy to just be here and be curious and, and see what God has for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I, would, I would say this as well, along with that, that, um, you know, truth needs to be spoken in, in, in situations. So depending on, on the moment and the person that I'm with, that I would want to speak truth about who they are in regards to God's design for them. Do you hear what I'm saying? Um, if, if this was my child, if this was somebody that I had influence in their life, um, I would want to remind them about the truth that is, is beyond what they feel in the moment, right? And so um, I, I would, uh, I, I think that that's important that we also say there, there is a moment when uh, it's appropriate for us to say, hey, this, let me hear you. After I've heard you, and I come back and I say, but I want to remind you who you are. And I want to remind you who God's called you to be. You know, um, wh one of the things I was, I was reading 1 Corinthians 6 um, this last week, and it, and it says, um, Paul says this, he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. It says neither sexually immoral, immoral people, um, idolaters. It goes on all these things. It says nor, um, nor those who practice homosexuality. It goes on nor thieves, nor drunkards, nor revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says this. He says, and such were some of you. Such were some of you, but you were washed. Do you hear the were? You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of the Lord. So he's speaking to those that, that had come to Jesus. And so there is a place as well when, when we're dealing with things that we need to come back and say, hey, I want to remind you who, who, who you used to be, and that's not who you are anymore. And I think that there's a place for that. And I, I think really making our response in these, our response in all of these moments matter. But I think like our response in these moments really do carry so much weight. And I think we have to understand who are we talking to? Um, and I'm not looking to like just classify and divide, but if I'm talking to somebody who loves Jesus and is in a relationship with Jesus, my conversation with them is going to look different when those who, versus someone who has yet to give their lives over to Jesus. The very crux of the gospel is you dying to your old self and you being born again. Yeah. So, like, even in the argument of, like, I was born this way, it's, it's no, you were made alive. You, you are now new. The old man is gone. The new is coming. That's what Josh is saying. Versus, like, if I'm talking with somebody who does not know, their eyes have not been enlightened to the good news of the yeah. gospel yet. My response in this moment is much difference. And what draws people to repentance? What draws people to the Lord? Kindness. Not know you're wrong. Like, it, and I think we can just get on this in this place of like, I've got the answer because I have the answer. And you do. But the way in which you present the answer matters. He's the way, the truth, and the life, right? Good. So Wait. good. And Aaron, I just want to add one quick thing to that. It's just beautiful what you said. And I'm aware that in this room, there are some of you who have come to Christ and your same-sex attraction is still with you. 
And I'm aware that that is a very difficult and perhaps scary and lonely place to be. And some of you have prayed and you've prayed and you've begged God to take that from you. And as Aaron is saying, we believe that he can. And if he hasn't, you don't have to battle that alone. Like, I just, like, I heard that man on Sunday say that if, if that is you, there is connection here for you in, in the middle of that battle and in the mess of that. It's, there's, shame does not have to be a part of that equation. We can just call it what it is and, and be welcome as a brother or a sister in this place in the middle of your wrestling. So, is that so good. Can I hear an amen on that in that house? Yeah, that's good. That's so good. Um, here's the last one. As someone who has experienced, this person says, sexual abuse in childhood and noticing my own issues with my sexual identity, impurity through life, what tips, recommendations would you have for me to prepare for healing now and the future? Yeah. Jeremy, you want to, we're working you tonight. I am I am so struck that the word hope uh, came out of of your mouth or your fingers as you typed that question and however old you are and statistically there are many men and women in this room who have been sexually abused. And I'm just aware that your whole life in one way or another has been, has been colored through that lens. Um, and I am, I'm just, I don't, I don't know, tearful that, um, that you hold out hope that healing is possible because it is. And you have likely spent many years um, keeping yourself safe. Well done. And you've likely spent many years protecting yourself and trying to figure out boundaries and wrestling with shame. And, and that's, that's big. And so um, I would invite you to just consider to have a posture of to continue with that posture of hope and to consider that perhaps there is this, like a, a sister or a brother like in Christ, someone who you, who you could trust to walk into those sacred and difficult places. And I think the last thing I would say is um, the way out is through. And so it's not like healing for you. I would love it if Jesus just like met you at the altar and healed you and that will be a part of, of, of your healing. And, and I would imagine that there's a lot of ways that Jesus wants to meet you um, along the way through, through a brother or sister that you can trust. And so it's not really a journey that you should take alone. Um, yeah, so much more I wanna say. I just wanna hug you and cry with you for a minute. And then, yeah, go explore and say something. <laughs> yeah, it's such an infiltration of the soul with that. Um, and so I love, like, your tenderness to that, Jeremy. And I think, you know, that's one person, but that's a lot of stories probably in this room and outside of this room. Yeah. Um, and... This is something that I like walk in often and it's really raw and wounding. Um, and oftentimes as a trauma therapist, as a human, um, there's some things that you can only do by yourself. And I think it's important to find, whether it is a therapist, you find brothers or sisters. Um, but trauma like that, unfortunately, the perpetrator cannot do the work for you. 
Well said. It's sometimes, it, I've said it like this, like when something like that happens, it's almost as though the perpetrator threw you in a pit and you scraped and you hit all the way to the bottom and you have this desire to get out and you feel stuck mm -hmm. and you're broken mm -hmm. and you just so badly want to have someone lure down and pull you out. And sometimes there's that, but there's a lot of times where it's strengthening yourself in the Lord and it is like doing the really hard work of trauma work a lot of times, which is exactly what you said. It's not around it. It's not getting over it, as some people might say. It is literally going through it and letting yourself go through the details of the rawness. Um, but I, you know, even when we were in worship, I, I was going to say this something to you, but I was like, I don't know, just as we've been praying and whatnot, like I have had like an ache in my arms and down in my wrists like throughout worship and I just feel like I know the Lord well enough to be like this isn't mine and so I don't know like one I was like okay Lord what is this and so I, I don't know if, if some people in here are having somatic issues meaning like you are literally having physical pain in your body that's been there for a really long time whether it's arthritis whether it's tendonitis I don't know what it is. Maybe you have an ability of function in your arms, your shoulders, down to your elbows and your wrists. There's something ailment in your body. And it's like debilitating to me. It has been this whole, like you've probably seen me, like I've been stretching, trying to like work it out. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit wants to release. Like there's, and I know this might feel graphic, so excuse me, but if there was like trauma where the arms were held down, who? that you were stuck. I just want to pray over release of the Holy Spirit over that and over your body to come alive and for the movement of the Holy Spirit to take reign in you. And so if that's you, I know that's really, really personal. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Who? And I know even in this audience, there may be people that actually were perpetrators. And I want to pray for them too. That they use their might maybe in their own arms to hurt somebody. Or you used your hands because you were a small child and you didn't have the guidance. And you have such tension in your body. Or you've used your hands in a way that has been wicked or has gone against yourself, like even pornography, masturbation, and spelled wrong. I just want to pray over whatever it might be in this room. And so, whew, Jesus, we just surrender to you. We thank you that you're here right now. You see it all. You were there. And we just ask that in that pain, you show us where you were and where you are now. You are not indifferent. You are not separated. You're not far away from it. You didn't turn your face. You held our very hand and you held our face and you cup it even now. And we just pray healing over these souls, over these minds, over these bodies. Get it. We ask for a release of that weight. And we just confess and we just give this to you, Jesus. Mm -hmm.